Now, when it comes to the actual birth of the Prophet wasallam, there are so many legends and so many narrations, not one of which is academically sound, except for one, except for one. All the rest of them are really legends. And these legends are mentioned, and subhanAllah, what is really amazing, and you know, I have to say this frankly here, that we don't need to invent lies to praise the Prophet We don't need to invent fairy tales. Allah has praised him enough, and the facts are enough. We don't need to, to, to fabricate things. And what is really amazing is that the earliest books you go to has the least information. But as you go on and on in history, then the books get bigger and bigger, and the details get more and more. And you wonder, where did this come from? And I mean, if you want to come to Mouse to even demonstrate to you, Ibn Ishaq is this big. And then I have another book written in the ninth century about the seerah. Wallahi, it is this big. Now, Ibn Ishaq is the first book of seerah, right? And he's saying, I want to write everything I come across. And it's this big. And then you have a book written 700 years later, five times the size of Ibn Ishaq. And this book is full of, and it is said to me, and my sheikh said, and this and that. Where is it coming from? Well, it's something that, as we said, a little bit legends and whatnot. So, what some of you might have heard, the Prophet was born, let's say, already circumcised. One, one report says. Another, another says he was born, and he fell into sajda. Another said he was born, and he lifted his finger to the sky to say the shahada. I mean, well, like, just we don't need to do this, and it makes a mockery of our religion. It makes a mockery of our religion. We don't need to invent these things about the Prophet ﷺ. He is the best human being, and the facts are enough to show us that. And when we resort to these tales, well, like, it, it makes our religion not look as dignified as it needs to. You know? Ibn Ishaq mentions none of these things, none of these things, because he doesn't have this information. But when you turn to books written in 700 Hijra, 800 Hijra, mashallah, the guy knows so many details, you wonder, where did he get it from? Okay, There's only one hadith that mentions the birth of the Prophet. He mentions his own birth. And it is a hadith narrated in Muslim Imam Ahmad, Imam Ahmad's book of hadith, and it is an authentic hadith. That the Prophet ﷺ said, when my mother gave birth to me. Aha, so now he's telling us. It's a hadith that goes back to him. It's not some... Because again, imagine who witnessed Amina in the room. Come on. You know, use the brain that Allah has given us. Would a man be there and witness Amina being given birth? So that he then narrates that when he came out, he fell into sajda. When he came out, he lifted his finger to the sky. I mean, you think about it. But now the Prophet is saying, so Allah told him this happened. He is saying, when my mother gave birth to me, this happened. Right? So now this is something we don't have to doubt at all. The Prophet is telling us. So he said that when my mother was carrying me, this is the first thing, that when my mother was carrying me, uh, and in one version, وضعتني, or gave birth to me, so there are both versions are mentioned, but the point is when he was either in the room or when he came out, my mother saw a light emanate from her that cast its light, or, or it reached all the way to the city of Busra in the land of Syria. The city of Busra in the land of Syria. Busra is on the on the south, which is the border of this, of what is, is what? Yudra. But these people don't know where Dara is, so that doesn't do us much good. Okay. I might, but these people don't know where Dara is. It's basically very close to the Arabian border. It's on more on the southern side of the Arabian, of what is now Saudi Arabia, it's closer to that side. So it's on the southern side of Syria. So the Prophet is saying that my mother saw a light, either in a dream or a physical light, he doesn't mention what, coming from her that came all the way and illuminated the the palaces or the city of Busra, uh, the palaces of the cities of Busra in Sham, in Syria. Now, what is the significance of this? Scholars have tried to understand why Syria and why you know this light coming from Amin. Of course, the light is him. The light is the Prophet that she's carrying something that will bring light to Busra of Sham. Allah knows best, but there's some things that have been derived here that Sham or Syria is mentioned because now the people of Syria can be happy. Alhamdulillah, there's a lot of Syrians here. Last time I taught this class, there was no Syrians there, so now we have a lot of Syrians here. Syria is a blessed land according to our religion. Now, before you get really happy, do realize that the Islamic Syria is not modern Syria. Islamic Syria includes modern-day Jordan and modern-day Palestine, a number of different. So Sham is broader than modern-day Syria. But you guys are included, so you can breathe easily. Alhamdulillah. So, you are the core. Yes, you are the core. True. So it is true that our religion considers Sham to be a holy land overall. And of course, uh, the, the children of Ishaq, uh, Bani Israel, the Jews, they always considered that region to be holy, and in particular, Palestine region to be holy. To this day, they do that, right? So we also believe that there is a type of holiness in these lands. And that, and that is why Allah says in the Quran, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, Abdihi Layla min al Masjid al Harami, ila al Masjid al Aqsa, alladhi barakna hawlahu. There is barakah around Masjid al Aqsa. This is Sham. Sham, there is barakah over there. And the Prophet ﷺ predicted that Sham will remain a fortress of Islam. There's always going to be people of Islam in uh, Sham. And amazingly, Sham was the first major country that was conquered, a uh, province that was conquered after the Arabian Peninsula, right? Right after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Sham was conquered. And one of the first cities, maybe even the first city that was outside the Arabian Peninsula is Musa. So there's an indication that the Prophet ﷺ is going to challenge that as quo. Sham was the right arm of the Byzantine Empire. I mean, Damascus, do you understand? We think of Damascus as an Arab land, an Arab civilization. Before the coming of Islam, Damascus was the right hand of the Byzantine Empire. It was the jewel of, of the Romans. It was where everything happened, commerce and trade and culture and civilization, everything was there. It was impossible for the Arabs to think that one day Damascus would be the core of Arab civilizations. The Umayyad's capital was Damascus. So by showing the light going to the borders of Syria, there's an indication that Islam is going to conquer this land. It will take over. And that's exactly what happened, that the very first land that was conquered was the land of uh, Syria.
And we also believe as Muslims that Isa ibn Maryam will come down in Sham. He's not going to come down in Makkah and Medina. He will descend in Sham because it was Sham that was made holy by his ancestors, the children of Ishaq. It was Sham that was made holy. And he will come down in uh, Damish. And that is where he will meet the Mahdi. And that is, of course, uh, towards the end of time. So Sham has a sim uh, symbolism. And of course, over at this point, I have to make dua that Allah Azza wa Jal frees Sham from the tyranny that it is currently undergoing. And that Allah helps uh, the people who are trying to oppose this, this tyranny and gives them sabr and patience. And may Allah Azza wa Jal bring the glory of Sham that used to be, bring it back to uh, Sham. Uh, we finish up here. There's only a few minutes left. We finish up here by mentioning a few more things that are uh, alleged to have occurred. Um, that are not found in the authentic books, but they're Allahu Adam. But it says that the uh, temples of the pagans fell down in other lands. I mean, these are things that there's no recorded history of, and I don't believe this to be true myself. Now, one thing a lot of scholars say that when the Prophet was born, this was when the jinn were stopped entry from the heavens. You guys are familiar with this concept? That the jinn were allowed entry into the heavens to listen to the angels. And Allah references in the Quran, in Surah Al Jinn, that. وَأَنَّ كُنَّا نَقْعُدُ مِنْهَا مَقَاعِدَ السَّمَاءِ We used to listen. We had our resting places, and we would listen to the uh, angelic discussions. Whoever listens now will find Shihab and Rasa. That were basically uh, comments or whatnot, uh, kicking him out. So one group of scholars says, when the Prophet was born, this was when the heavens were closed to these shayateen. But the correct opinion is that this occurred not at the birth, but when he became a Prophet, i.e. at the age of 40. And this is clearly referenced in other hadith as well. That when Iqra came down, when Jibreel came down, basically revelation, that was when the skies were closed. And that was when the jinns began wondering what is happening. And then Allah says in the Quran that a group of jinn heard the Quran being recited. And they came back believing in the Quran. So this did not occur at the birth. I just wanted to point that out. And the final thing that we'll say, time is already up. Subhanallah, I was wanting to go a few more pages, but uh, time is already up. Uh, Ibn Ishaq mentions that the Prophet was circumcised on the seventh day. Pause here for a while. Later books, seven centuries later, mention he was born uncircumcised. The first book mentions, factually, matter of fact, that Ibn that his grandfather circumcised him on the seventh day. And this is, how there's nothing wrong with this. He is a normal child, born of a normal uh, uh, marriage, a normal birth. And so his grandfather circumcised him on the seventh day. And his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, held a feast for him. And his grandfather chose the name Muhammad, which was a unique and unusual name. Some scholars say that this was an unknown name to the Arabs. And one group of scholars says, well, it was known, but it was not common. And this seems to be the stronger opinion. Because there are people whose references we have, whose name was Muhammad. But it was a very uncommon name. And there was nobody in Mecca by that name. Nobody in Mecca. So when people ask Abdul Muttalib, why are you calling him by a name that nobody knows? Nobody's heard of. Why don't you call him one of your standard names of your fathers and, and forefathers? He said, I want him to be praised by the people of the earth as I want him to be praised by the people of the heavens. Muhammad means the one who is praised. I want him to be praised by the people of the earth as I want him to be praised by the people in the heavens. And when the Prophet ﷺ was born, uh, the news spread amongst uh, the Quraysh and Abu Lahab, who was later to become an enemy, at this time, of course, he is an uncle, and of course, he's always going to remain an uncle, but at this time, he's not an enemy. Abu Lahab, who was one of the older uncles, by the way, because remember, there were 10 brothers, and Abu Lahab was born of an, another mother, no other full brother. Abu Lahab did not have any full brother. Abu Talib and Abdullah were full brothers, and others were full brothers. Hamza and others were full brothers. Hamza and Safiya were full brother and sister. Abu Lahab was his own. He didn't have any full. He was much older. So perhaps he felt a type of, I have to care for this offspring, this orphan. You know, my younger brother died, and whatnot. Perhaps he felt some sympathy, and so. The, the girl that came running, the slave girl that came running to tell him that your uh, son's brother has been born, or your son's offspring has been born, this girl, as soon as Abu Lahab heard the news, he told her, I set you free. I'm so happy, you're free. It was a slave girl. So he became so happy that just because she came with this good news, he set her free. It shows he was so happy. And her name was Thuwayba. Thuwayba. And in our Indian Pakistani culture, it was transformed to Sobia. But it is in fact Thuwayba. Uh, and so, and those of you who are named Sobia, this goes back to this misreading of Thuwayba. Uh, Nothing wrong with it, by the way, but it's just the, the, the name. Uh, and so uh, there's a hadith in Muslim Ahmed, and with this hadith we conclude and then pray, inshallah, that Hamza saw, or sorry, not Hamza, Abbas, Abbas saw Abu Lahab in a dream after he died, Abu Lahab, after Abu Lahab died. He saw him in a dream. And he saw him being punished with the utmost severe punishment, because this is Abu Lahab, the Abu Lahab in Watab. So Abbas said to him, did not your relationship with the Prophet and your uncle, basically, you're the, you know, benefit you? He said, no, except for one thing that I did. That when the good news came that he was born, I freed Thuwayba. And because of this, I am allowed a few drops of water. A few drops of water. Because I did this good thing when the Prophet was born, because of this, I'm allowed just a little bit of, of that's my concession that's given to me. That's all that is uh, given to him. But the point being that he released Thuwayba and gave, made her free, so she was happy at the birth of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.